Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome, <coughs> excuse me, welcome to Cars and Coffee and Brake Pads. I guess I should put the smiley face up like that. <coughs> this, it's getting to be that time of year. We've got a lot of questions, people calling in wanting to know about the right brake pads. So I'm going to go through a little kind of primer to talk about what, how to choose the right brake pad for your application and also tell you what those numbers mean on the back. Also, we're going to talk about adjustable sway bar end lengths. And boy, we got other stuff. We got some really great questions this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about the upcoming three day Transform Your Driving Experience workshop that starts on May 30th. March, March 30th. I'm getting ahead of myself. The sun shining is nice outside, so I'm thinking the wrong month. March 30th. Uh, and of course, I got questions, and you can always send in questions uh, for me to answer live. If I can answer them, I will. If I don't know the answer, I'm not very good at BS, so I'll just tell you I don't know the answer or give you some of my thoughts anyway. So, boy, I don't know where to Oh, uh, the art, artwork this month is uh, Dan Gurney again. This has got to be one of my favorites. Uh, it's Dan Gurney at Le Mans, 1965, driving into the sunset. And if you look close, you can see he's got his hand up, shielding his eyes. You can see he's got, uh, he's got, he's got a Rolex and, uh, the, you know, remember the lace driving gloves of the 60s? <clears throat> How do I know he's driving into the sunset? Really easy. If you if you notice, the headlights and driving lights are still covered. Uh, that, that's what we do in endurance racing: is you you cover your your driving lights at least back then, until you absolutely have to have them. That way, when you when you take the covers off, it's nighttime, they're nice and fresh and clear. You don't have a lot of gunk and oil and dirt on top of them. So uh, that's the art for today. And uh, where should we start? Uh, why don't we start with a few questions? We've got some really good ones this week. And uh, it's okay. First, we're going to do a really big shout out to Rory. Uh, we uh, were having trouble finding uh, a right rear spindle for Rory's uh, NASA AIX Cobra. Uh, he was in an accident, and they're, they're the scarcest hen seed. And we were looking for any any kind of spindle that maybe we could take and and and, and build our own. Uh, Rory actually found what he thought was a left rear spindle when it got here it was actually a right rear exactly what we needed so I, that's a big big shout out to, to rory for helping us out uh, anybody else if you, you see any S, S, sn95 cobra rear spindles uh, let us know uh, we're we'd like to try to collect them uh, but they're just they're just so hard to find uh see rory also said he's, he's looking to purchase a new explorer st and was wondering if i had any thoughts on the handling and abilities uh I don't, I don't exactly because I've never driven one. But what I can tell you is the Ford Performance Group put a lot of effort into the entire like uh, Ford Performance line, which includes the ST, the ST uh, Explorer, the ST Edge, the ST Focus. Uh, they put a lot of effort and they've got you know better suspension and everything. So I, I would think it's it would be a pretty really nice really nice package. Uh, I know some people at Ford Performance. I wonder how wonder if I can talk one of them into coming on sometime and talking about that. I'll have, I'll have to dig into that. Uh, sir, sir, Rory has a lot of questions today. Also, he's updating uh, his Fox with a 2000 R steering rack. Uh, uh, he wants to know if it's the correct move for a quicker steering ratio and uh, quicker isn't always the best plan. I I, I, I think the other way. I, I think that, that that's a great steering rack. I, I highly recommend it. You know, we use it. Uh, and you need a quick steering rack, especially if you're doing performance driving. If you need to make a quick adjustment, I mean, it, 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 would you rather do this or that? So, yeah, it's a great steering rack. You made, you made a great decision. Uh, I'm not sure what it means is the possible uh, power rear steer assist, if beneficial. I don't know if he's talking about, like, right foot th throttle steer, like making the car slide. If that's the case, you know, we never want a car to slide. We want the car to hook up get grip and go. Uh, and also the pros and cons of uh, uh, cages for, for street and track. I'm, I'm not a fan of cages for the street because it's really not necessary. Uh, for the track, it depends on what your car you have. He's concerned about his head banging off of it. Uh, there's a lot of different ones out there. You just have to look and see if, if there's room. And uh, on track, you've always got a helmet. So your, your noggin's gonna always, you know, kind of be protected. But on the street, you, you just want to uh, you just want to be sure that you know your head is anywhere close. 
for the S one ninety sevens and five fifties, we use a really great uh, four point uh, roll bar. It, it packages very well. There, there's no no head interference. Uh, you're just going to have to look and see what makes sense. Uh, you know, they're they're good for the track, and it's a nice extra safety measure, particularly older cars, uh, newer cars. We've got options. We do have, I think, a couple of the SN95 street cages that we built left. Uh, that would that would be a rich question. So uh, moving right along. Uh, okay, Mike wants to know: Does adding bump steer correction kit change the amount of static camber you should run? No. It has absolutely nothing to do with camber. It has to do with steering. Now here's a here's a stock tie rod end. Okay. Now this is the the OE quality forged bump steer tie rod end that we use. And you can see it's got an extended shaft, which is what we want to do. We want to try to uh, get the, the bump steer, try to make the the, the uh, tie rod parallel to the lower control arm. Uh, this is the one we use. And a lot of people have like rod ends went out there and I'm I'm not a big fan of that, at least for S S197s, uh, because you got a rod end, and, and most of them don't use very good quality, and they rattle, and you have to play with adjusting it. That's really simple. You bolt it on; it's greasable. So it has absolutely nothing to do with uh, with with uh, with camber. It has everything to do with bump steer. Uh, let's see, Mark White had a question, but we set up a 15 minute consult. He got he got his answer. Uh, Ernie, I'm not sure what the question is. Boss fueling, boss dash fuel injectors changing cold air, throttle body, and intake manifold. Uh, and then as far as I'm taking a stab at what he's wanting to change cold air and throttle body and, and, and that sort of thing, uh, the boss is a great package out of the box. It's got a great intake manifold. I mean, the only there's other ones available, but mostly any other intake manifolds for drag racing. Uh, the Boss intake manifold is great, and all we all we did, like on my car, is we put uh, our JLT cold air kit on. We put uh, headers, uh, high flow cats, and uh, for the street, and then we took them off to the track. We had them really interchangeable, and then uh, three inch stainless exhaust at the back and race mufflers. And you know, you do that and get a tune. You're making you know, 440 to the wheels, which is like over 500. A flywheel, which I mean, that, that's a great engine package. You don't have to change injectors. Uh, uh, cold air kit is good. Throttle body. Uh, there's, you know, there's, there's not a lot of gain. Let's say to just putting a throttle body on. Uh, sometimes uh, people put too big of a throttle body on and it actually reduces uh, runner velocity because it opens this great big thing. A bunch of air comes in. And it kind of tumbles around. So, I mean, just cold air, headers, a good tune. You're running 440 to the ground, five, 500, 510 flywheel. That's that's what I use in my track cars. And we've done quite a few boss like boss like that. We've actually taken uh, some GTs and put the boss intake manifold on and, tune, and tuned them that way. And it makes great power. Uh, let's see, I think Hurst is going to push off the next week. Uh, <laughs> Here's one great one from Steve. To balance or not to balance race tires? Balance. <laughs> balance. If you don't, you got uh, two things that are going to happen. Either the steering wheel is going to go like this or the car is going to start going like that. Uh, it's, it's rotating mass. And uh, if it's rotating mass, it's got to be balanced and it has to be smooth. Uh, you know, you upset rotating mass and bad things happen. Absolutely balance race tires. I know... The real race tires, like like the probably slicks that we use for World Challenge, uh, they're a lot lighter than than like street tires. And some people think that because they're so light, they might not be balanced. Maybe that's your thought. Balance, absolutely balance. Uh, but if you watch Formula One, you can you can you know you can uh, think back and some of the drivers complain about a vibration, uh, and they go in and get the tires changed the way they go. You don't want a vibration because. That's when they, they lock they lock they lock a wheel and get a flat spot. Uh, oh, this is and this is Omar. We're going we're, we're going to end the questions with Omar. Any more questions? Please send them in. Omar says hello, well, hello Omar. Uh, on the on the on my Pro 4R race calipers for S197, can you upgrade to a 15 inch rotor? Will it be beneficial? Uh, 
here, here's the thing. We never put any thought into a 15-inch rotor for the Pro 4R brakes. And the reason is it's a race brake setup. And in racing, uh, most series use 18-inch race tires, which means an 18-inch wheel. So put it, you could squeeze uh, you know, a 15-inch rotor into an 18-inch wheel if you know if the right type of wheel. But man, you're putting that rotor, that hot rotor, just really close to the wheel. And you, if a rock gets up there and caught, I mean, you scar the wheel. So a 14 inch is what we use. Uh, you know, at, that's what I what recommend. I mean, the, they were great brakes. I mean, they've got, for the rotors, there are spec rotors. So they're like seven pounds lighter than a regular rotor. They got more fins, they cool better. Uh, they got, you know, it's kind of a mini floater, floating rotor. So yeah, it's, uh, and also the other one though, that my perspective on the Bear 6R versus my Pro 4R, what would be better? In terms of performance on track, what would Kenny get? Well, I'd get my Pro 4Rs for sure. Here's the thing. The the, the big difference between the, my Pro 4R race brakes and the Bear 6R race brakes is there's two big differences. Price, actually three. Price, weight, and the number of pistons. Uh, you know, by using a four-piston rotor, a four-piston caliper, we cut weight out. And we also take, we, we, ch we chop a lot of weight out of the caliper itself in non-critical areas to, to lighten that up. Uh, but here's the thing, the, the Pro 4R takes the exact same brake pad profile as the 6R, six piston race caliper. The, other, the difference is the six piston race caliper, the, the thickness on the brake pad is 0.71, which is kind of standard. It's HB 122 pad in Hawk. Well, the Pro 4R takes the exact pad profile, uh, but the, the brake pads are an inch thick. They're 0.98 inches thick. So I mean, there's a lot of advantages to run the Pro 4Rs, and that, that's why we developed them. I wanted to come up with a really outstanding brake package at a really outstanding price. And you know, to get the kind of features that we offer, you got to spend a lot more money. And uh, like I say, it's just we've done everything to make that the best brake, uh, brake package available. So, okay, I zip through the questions. Now I get back to my sheet. Oh, you know what? I don't even think I said who I am. <laughs> this is Cars and Coffee, and I'm Kenny Brown. And, uh, okay, Curry's holding up a sign. The sign says, oh, <laughs> I just completely, I got, I got, so, got so wrapped up in, in brake pads and, and uh, just well, end links. I'm going to spend the next hour, well, 50 minutes now. Uh, sharing with you, you know, some of my knowledge and experience from a lot of years in professional motorsports and building great cars. And, you know, I'm here to answer your questions. I mean, that's why we, the whole reason we started Cars and Coffee. And everything I'm going to talk about today came from questions to the Speed Therapy Society. Uh, if, you're, if you're not a member, you know, please join. At the Facebook, there should be a linky thing somewhere. Uh, if if you like what, I'm, what we're going to talk about and you need to share it with a buddy, please share or there's a little clicky thing that you can start a watch party and invite some people. Because it's going to be pretty interesting what we talk about today. Speaking of which, where are we? Uh, okay, I talked about the, oh, I, I remember we showed some pictures of, of Cliff's uh, number 44 World uh, Mustang Challenge car that I actually engineered back in the Mustang Challenge days. Well, I was looking and looking for pictures uh, last, the other week, and I just couldn't, we could not find them, you know, Carrie, Look, she couldn't find them. Brad couldn't find them. Well, I just went through all my pictures and I had them, but they were the folder was stuck in another folder. That's why I couldn't find them. But so we got a few uh, cool pictures we're going to share with you from that. So uh, let's see. Uh, let me touch on the three before we switch. What's my page? The uh, three day uh, transforming transforming your driving experience workshop. Uh, starts on March 30th. Well, March and May have the same first letter. March is start on March 30th. And here, here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about, you know, this is from my perspective. And, you know, I've been building really cool cars and championship winning race cars for years. And we're going to talk about how I do it. And uh, we're going to talk about the first five critical steps to improving your driving experience. Then we're talk, going to talk about my five secrets on building great cars, whether it's a street car, track car, or race car. And then we're going to build, talk about building performance platform. 
uh, dialing in the car for maximum performance, refining your, refining your driving techniques. So it's going to be, I mean, I'm going to, it's, it's, I'm going to try to give you as, as much as I can in a short amount of time. And that's, and then it's, if you don't get enough information or you're just thirsting for more information, uh, please consider uh, joining the next uh, Speed Therapy Academy, which starts April. Oh, the speed, oh, the, I think it's April 12th. It starts like the second week of April. <laughs> so the Speed Therapy Academy is, if you don't know, that's, it meets twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, seven o'clock. Oh, the uh, Transforming Your Driving Experience Workshop mm -hmm. is seven o'clock, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And you, can register and you can register in the comment section. But in the academy, I just, I go, I go really, we'll take one week and we'll just talk about one subject. It's kind of like I stand here and I kind of empty out my brain uh, and, and share a lot of information. Uh, and the, the, the cool thing is every, every week we call it immersion session because we immerse ourselves into, into a specific topic. Uh, that, there's a PowerPoint that goes with that. That PowerPoint lives in the uh, archive section. So the academy members have access to that all the time. You can go back and, and review uh, what we talked about. And they also have bonuses like they get to audit any, any special, uh, any special uh, events or things that we do. Uh, they get the option to, to audit it, plus they get pre-bedded brake pads. We'll talk about that too. Well, maybe that's my lead into brake pads. Yeah, it could be, but I want to interrupt you just for a moment like I always do. Yeah. So talking about the workshop, I don't think I've shared this with you yet. And you really haven't signed off on it, but I'm signing off on it. How's that sound? Okay, I think this this is this is what you call a pressure move. <laughs> she's telling you, she's telling me in front of you, so I don't have a choice. Yep, that's the way it works. Okay. Okay. So anyway, what for, am I going to agree to? What we're going to do is for the the three day uh, transform your driving experience workshop, we are going to give away one scholarship to the Speed Therapy Academy. Oh. So, but you have to you have to participate, and if you come on, uh, register, and then come on the first day, and we'll explain um, some of the things to earn that. So we're going to give away again one scholarship, and that's like yeah, a yeah we gave we gave away we, yeah gave away a scholarship to somebody in, in the first academy, uh -huh. and uh, he he was blown away about uh -huh. how much he learned, and he was eternally thankful. Okay, let's let's kind of like. We got all that out of the way. Let's just get to the real stuff. Let's, let's talk tech. Brake pads. Okay, this is as what would have it. This is uh, Christopher's brake pads just came in yesterday and are getting shipped out Monday. So I, I borrowed them to show you. But uh, these, the current brake pads that we're using, we, we've shifted over. We traditionally use uh, Hawk racing pads. And for, you know, for hardcore racing on some applications, we would still use Hawk. Uh, but we switched over to uh, G locks for tr for our track guys for two big differences. Number one, they're really easy on rotors, and secondly, we can actually order them pre bedded. As I say, like the Speed Therapy Academy alumni, they order brake pads. They they're uh, pre bedded for free. What does pre bedding mean? Well, when you get like a race type pad, uh, you have to bed them. Essentially, what that means is you waste a full session. The first morning because you have to like uh, speed break speed break speed break until you get up to speed until you get the brakes really hot so hot that you smell them and so hot that when you put your foot on the on the on the brake it's hard as a rock and the car doesn't stop uh, then you take it in you let the brakes cool off completely and next time you go out you got brakes so by getting them pre bed it saves a whole session but how do you choose which brake pads See that's 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 a lot of people don't understand that, that brake pads are specific, are compounded in a specific target temperature range. Uh, if somebody wants to sell you track pads and they don't tell you what the temperature range is, don't buy them. Uh, you need to know. Uh, there's a, I mean, you've got to get if you get a, a, a like we've seen people get a really aggressive race pads and go to the track and you know their their car will like moan going around the corner. Yeah, one of our one of our uh, our uh, uh, alumni in in the academy. We did a we do a, this uh, kind of like video uh, driving coach thing at the end. And I heard his brakes, and I told him right away that he's got too hard of a compound that they aren't getting hot enough to work. So you've got to get the compound matched to the temperature they're running. And 
so that you get get the best working out of them. If if a, if you got a hard brake pad and it's squeaking, uh, it's 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 too hard, too high temperature range. If you got brake pads that you know burn up in two sessions, temperature range is too low. So, how do you know what temperature range? Well, that's 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 a pretty good question. Call me. <laughs> I, I I I know what temperatures these things run at. How do I know that? Well, yeah, I'll we'll bring it. Uh oh, you're gonna have to take down your banner. Okay. Okay. If you can see in this rotor, it's got red paint. But that paint is actually uh, brake rotor temperature paint. What happens when it comes to this nifty little little thing? And this little little jar of brake paint. What happens is it goes through different temperature ranges to color change it. And they get it comes with a little nifty little card. So you can see, but I, but I did, we kind of blew that up. So you can see that, I got this out so I can read and show it at the same time because I can't read backwards. Okay, so it starts at red and it goes from zero degrees up to at, at about, uh, let's say 700 degrees. It starts going from red, red to red brown. Now, when it gets up to about 800 degrees, it'll go from red brown to brown. When it gets up to 1100 degrees, it'll go from brown to yellow, yellow green. And when it gets to like 1350, it'll go to green. When it goes gets to 1470, it goes to beige. And you know, over 1400, over, over 1500 degrees, it'll be beige. My, my brakes typically run in the 1200 range well, for, for track driving. Uh, so I have brake pads that have the optimum uh, braking in that 1200 range. And as far as brake pad compounds, uh, let, let me kind of tell you, I mean, if you, if you want some recommendations, please set up a 15 minute consult and talk to me. Uh, but I'll just give you kind of a brief overview of how many different compound compounds we have. And some of the temperature range crosses over, but there's different characteristics. So like, but we, we start out for a street pad and this is like most performance street pads, they're good up to 800 degrees. Well, you know, my rotors run 1200 degrees on track. So obviously we'll, we, I burn them up. Uh, the next level up goes, you know, goes from zero up to a thousand degrees, which is kind of like, it's good initial base, kind of like maybe a, an autocross type brake pad. Uh, and it, it, that's a kind of, right, but you could drive it to the track and, but it, not recommend to drive it every day because it's just it's not going to generate enough heat and then the next level up is goes from 74 degrees up to 1250 uh and that's kind of a that's kind of a, a good beginning brake pad uh, if you're a uh, novice intermediate because uh, it, it, it typically you're not going to be you haven't really learned how to really lean on the brakes yet uh, i also use that compound uh, for for a rear compound and for the track people and then uh, the next level up is uh, from 118 degrees to 1475. Now, I'll use that both for uh, front and some some back. Uh, Herstifer, that's what he wanted, so he's got, that's why I wrote the numbers on the back. You can see it goes from 118 degrees to 1475. That's the heat range. Now, his back ones are the compound before, and they go from 74 to 1250. So I always put like a less aggressive pad on the back because the brakes, you know, don't use the rear brakes as much as the front. So that's kind of like a, a, a track day pad, but you know, I, the next level up is, just, you know, somebody that's an advanced driver who really drives hard. Now the compound goes from 173 to 1860. That's, that's a lot of temperature. And then the next compound up on the chart uh, actually goes from uh, 210 to 1400. Huh? John? John? Yeah. What chart? You're talking about the chart. Oh, my chart. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Talking about my brake compound chart. Sorry about that. Uh, it's, it goes to 1,400 degrees, but it's it's really uh, designed for more like a lightweight, low, low horsepower car. 
And then we could get into like totally serious race breaks. Uh, the next one up goes from 255 to 2000. Uh, and the next one up from that goes from 610 to 2100. So, I mean, if, if you're, if you're breaking it for at first, the, the uh, 610 to 2100, you want to be in that 1500, 1600 range of break temperature. So that you're, you want to be right in the middle of, of, the, of the temperature range because that's when you're going to get your best performance. And, and remember I said, you know, if the, if the bed breaks, uh, it takes a full session. Uh, and that's, that's kind of like one of the bummer things of, of putting new brake pads in, but getting them pre-bedded. And also these pads are super easy in rotors. And don't forget with high temperatures, you need a high temperature brake fluid. Uh, absolutely, positively need a high temperature brake fluid. And I believe my brakes every day at the track. Uh, I like fresh brake fluid because I don't like hitting walls or trees. So let's uh, talk about sway bar adjustable end links. We've got a full range. Let's see, this is for S197. This is for 560. This is for SN95 with our control arms and our, our front sway bar. And this is for uh, IRS covers. So What's the purpose and do you need adjustable sway bar end links? Well, they serve a couple of, a couple of purposes. If, if you have a race car and you don't have like ABS that kind of you know, does the brake faking for you, uh, if your sway bar is preloaded, like if to get, like you're hooking your sway bar up, <clears throat> but to get, get the, you know, the one, you put one side in and put the other side in, maybe you have to pull it down, stick it in, you're preloading your sway bar, which means uh, at some point, you're going to lock up the front tire. So by having adjustable sway bar end links, you can you can make sure that it's, it's totally negative, that you know the it slides in and out when when you hook them up, and that way it's not preloaded. The other thing is you can also like adjust the geometry a little bit. Now, so when you lower your car, let's say you're you know you're you're up here, you lower your car, and what happens is the, the strut stays where it is, but lower control arm moves and the, the sway bar when you load the car the sway bar move it's it's kind of a way to get the uh, get the sway bar a little more parallel to the ground if you lower the car if you lower the car it goes up so you can just shorten it up and get a little power it doesn't have to be parallel i just in my mind i just think it looks better that way uh it probably gives you better range of sway bar too so i mean that's if, i mean i they're important uh, I mean, if you're a serious driver, uh, have a performance sway bar on, you need sway bar adjustable end links. And I mean, at the very least, uh, have one so that you don't preload your sway bar. Your, pre, your sway bar isn't preloaded at any point. Oh, you also want to only hook your sway bar up when the car is on the ground and weight is on it so you make sure that it's neutral. Uh, another little tip if, if you know, I don't really recommend scaling cars for for track day guys but in in for a real race car uh in scaling it you always want to unhook the sway bars when you scale the car uh, because, because you want you want to get the true weight per corner so well we've moved through a lot of things but also on um, your brake pads that get hot brake ducts now we've got brake ducts for sn95 sn97 and 550 and those have been with me before i know that i exclusively use three inch hose uh, just simply because for SN95 and 197s, we can, we can kind of squish a three inch tube down to oval. And because of that, it goes, see, demonstrate it. I don't know if we do that. Let's see. Okay. We'll go up here. All of that air goes exclusively into the center, the eye of the rotor, because rotors cool from the inside out. So that's that's why I use the three inch. Uh, there's like a lot of four inch kits out there, and if you look at it for a four inch, you know part of the part of the inlet hits the face of the rotor, part hits the eye, and it just it the air tumbles uh, and doesn't flow so cleanly in the eye, and also it makes the inside rotor temperature less than the outside rotor temperature, which could mean uh, uneven brake pad wear. Did I get through everything? No, you forgot about the memories and time. Oh, memories and time. 
Okay. Close car. Okay, I, I'm going to need some assistance for this. Like I say, I, I, I was looking, I knew that the pictures had to be somewhere, and I just started looking through all the different folders in my computer, and bingo, I found it. So here we go. I'm ready. So here's Cliff's car, uh, Mustang Challenge, in Mustang Challenge trim. Uh, I guess, I think Ed, I can't remember his name, uh, drove that car in the Mustang Challenge. Ed Lever, maybe? I gotta go back and check my notes. But here, here's what, here's the cool picture I was looking for. Next. At, uh, at the 45th Mustang anniversary, uh, we did a promotion for Ford where we had Scott Pruitt and Tommy Kendall uh, driving uh, our, our uh, cars, the Speedworks cars. I, I was the engineer for Speedworks, and then we had three Mustang Challenge Mustangs. So they had Scott Pruitt and, and, and Tommy Kendall, which was kind of cool because I had worked with both of those guys in the past. It was nice seeing them again. Uh, and then we got the next slide, he was driving. Oh, my goodness, it's Cliff's car. Uh, Scott Pruitt was driving Cliff's car. Uh, and so that, that thought, I thought that was kind of cool, a nice piece of like Mustang or, or our memorabilia. And then uh, the next one, okay, that kind of shows this like Peter in front. I'm right behind Peter. Uh, Paul, my son, late son, is uh, on the left, and my mechanics are behind the car. And you are obviously having a, you know, a meeting talking about setup. Uh, Paul was there. He actually drove M69. He was driving M69 and giving rides. And uh, he just, you know, he just was blown away by just how good M69 handled. Uh, I mean, he had he had done a little bit of development testing for me in, in the beginning, and he got to drive it. We did, did a few more things. He just he loved it. And that's the same AGS 4.0 that we have for all the S197 Mustangs now. So he he was part of my development in doing that rear suspension. And the last picture, who's that tiny person in the middle? That's, uh, that's, that's Kerry with uh, uh, Scott Pruitt, and just lets you know how tall Tommy Kendall really is. I mean, he sort of has to pour himself into cars. He, he drove, uh, and among other things, he drove my uh, 96 Red Rocket uh, at, uh, for the uh, car and driver uh, zero, to 150, 0 to 150 to 0 uh, article, and he, he loved it. He just thought it was a great handling car. So that, that you know, he, like my, my cars work. Uh, anybody that's ever driven one, I'll tell you. Anybody that has my stuff, I'll tell you. So anyway, that, that's that's a little trip down memory lane. Now I think I've gotten through just about everything. I'm surprised I had so much to talk about. Uh, so do we have any questions coming up? Uh, you got any more questions, just send them in. I'll do the best I can to, to answer them. You definitely had your coffee this morning. You flew through those questions. Yeah, I kind of, once I get, once I start talking tech, I got kind of wound up. You know, people have been brown for a while, kind of know that. Okay. I just, just get excited. I love talking about stuff, uh, teaching people stuff. That's, that's how we do cars. Coffee, the, the, uh, the workshop and also the academy. Looks like Jay Myers was the first one to sign up for the uh, three-day Transform Your Driving Experience. Go workshop. Jay! And Jay has also he's pre-registered for the next academy coming oh, up. Oh, cool! Too. Yeah, so that's really cool. Looking forward to see you there because the academy is on Zoom, so actually I see everybody that's there. Uh, it's, it's not like this. We, we do Zoom, so everybody can participate. Okay, so some of these questions I think you've already answered. But I'm going to, uh, Jay Andrew asks, best pads for track days? Okay, it depends on where your level of, of driving is. Uh, if you're a novice, like your first outing or two, uh, or even up to intermediate, uh, you know, the 74 to 1200 would be good. Uh, if you've got a few more track days in you than that, <clears throat> then we, we'd move you up to the, uh, Eight, eight, uh, 118 to 1475 temperature range. Uh, my, my rotors run 1200 degrees, uh, just like clockwork. Uh, and if you're super, you've got a super fast car and, and advanced, then we could move you into the, the uh, uh, 173 to 1800 range. Uh, I mean, those, those are kind of like the, the three track day pads 
And whatever we do on the front, we do one, one, one uh, lighter compound on the back. So, I mean, if you want to call in and, and talk to me about your car and your driving, uh, I'll come up with a pad for you. And remember, we, we can get them pre bed which you know, saves a whole session. And that's that's kind of interesting, too. Just uh, schedule 15 minutes. There's a, probably a link on the uh, in the comments right now where you can schedule 15 minutes. And Kenny would prefer that you get the right pad than not. So he'll yeah. take the time to help you out with that. Okay, the next one is, um, I believe this is from Robert. Uh, should I upgrade my SM95 Mustang anti-roll bar assembly? It seems okay, but I really want my car to corner as well as it can. Okay, uh, the answer is is a kind of yes. Uh, if, if it's an SM95, I mean, we've got a really good K-member uh, package that's, uh, that fixes the geometry. Uh, also, uh, I, I, you know, springs and shocks. Uh, are the best way to improve performance. And uh, we've got, uh, you know, the option, what we've done is I like coilovers. I mean, I everything I do is coilovers. Why? Because we can just ride height. Secondly, it gives me a, a big range of, of different uh, spring spring rates to run. And for those that have got coilovers from me, they know that the, like, the coilover comes uh, completely assembled. You know, the, the springs, everything is put together. And with a pre-adjustment, and then some recommended adjustments, at, so sort of basic how to adjust your shocks. Plus, it comes with my experience in adjusting shocks. I mean, you can you can call me and we talk about adjusting your shocks. But we've got a package for SN95 that uh, we it's 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 my custom valving that I had uh, built for me by Strange. Uh, it's a double adjustable front and either double or single adjustable rear. But most of the time, it's a single adjustable uh, for the back. And, and I don't have uh, suspension for the back yet. Uh, we had a really nice suspension uh, before I, you know, took time for health, and we haven't brought that back because it was one of the biggest pain in the butt products we had. There's on, on Fox and SN95. There's so many different exhaust systems, and you know that the, you know, it's really tight back there. There's limited real estate, and no matter what we do, you know, people would say it's banging, it's rattling. Uh, you know, we we couldn't build them for every, every single. Uh, exhaust system plus people never read the instructions and the the key to when we had the panel bar on the on the 197s in fox is that you had to have rear parallel of the rear panel bar was just like in the 197s where we moved the the, the panel bar down the bottom differential to bring the rear roll center down we use that in and that to bring the roll center down because the roll center is like up in the trunk uh, if you do the math and roll center is you know it keeps the car from rolling and gets around the quarter better uh, but the problem is that this, the panel bar has to be dead nuts neutral. It has to be no preload on it. And people really wouldn't pay attention because the car has to be on the ground, full weight on the car, full weight on the ground. And there has to be like you can slide the bolt in and out uh, with, with no problem. A lot of people would adjust it up in the air and put it down and it, it just, it would preload and it just, it just wouldn't work. So we haven't brought that back. I've got something I'd like to do in a year or so. Uh, but for right now, we just have a front. What we do, we do a lot of is uh, uh, the IRS in the back. We have, we're the only people that really support IRS Cobras or IRS Mustangs. We have a lot of guys putting IRS cars into both SN95 and Fox. So that's getting me really popular. Like we, we've got the full package and nobody else knows IRS is like we do. And we're actually test, aren't we testing something, a conversion IRS into the Fox? Uh, yeah, actually, we're we're looking at modifying what we do when we do our. <clears throat> we have we got like four levels of upgrades to the IRS, and the last level is we do a complete geometry change. You know, the the pickup points come off and they get they get put back on in different spots. So we so I improve the rear geometry significantly. Uh, and what was I saying? You're talking about the fox. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Oh, I was goodness. talking about geometry. I forgot the question. <laughs> so, you know, you know, complete geometry package. But what happens is we put in the back, we take this great big clunky uh, bracket that bolts to the frame in the back. We cut that off and chuck it. And we put we put a bracket that's a flat plate that bolts directly to the frame, the frame rail, uh, which completely stabilizes the, the IRS carrier. Well, they've been for like S S S and 95s. But we have so many people doing Fox that we found out there's 
the holes are different for like where the quad shock mounts on a Fox. So we're, we're right now we're working on a template to put an extra hole in there uh, on the bracket so that it's, it, uh, it'll work on a Fox too, just bolt in without having to drill. So that's, that's, that's in the works. Or, you know, we, we, we saw a need and we're reacting to it. There's a lot of, have a lot of people putting, you know, the, the IRS in Fox and it's a 95. And I tell you, the IRS in the back and our, my front suspension, you talk and, and in the spring and shock package, you talk about a car that handles. I mean, it, it just blow you away just how, how well that handles and the, the great manner that it has. Okay. Uh, so, and Joe's in the audience. He had a, uh, he had the uh, Cobra with that, your whole suspension on it too. Okay, so here's the next question, and this was from Rory. This is a continuation of the question you asked earlier, giving you more information. I was talking about the full four-wheel steering, like using a rack and pinion in, in rear for assisting steering. Remember that? Uh, you know, that's that's great for parking a car uh, or for street cars. It's, you know, it's, it's I've never, ever used it or seen it used on a, on a race car. Uh, you have to be pretty sophisticated to get the electronics right. It's got to be electronics here, and it has to be pretty sophisticated to get the electronics right. I can tell you that, uh, it's, it's, I'll give you a rear steer example. The, uh, the SN95 IRS Cobras, uh, I discovered then, I, guess I can't remember what year it was, we were down at Road Atlanta with Ford Racing doing a demonstration. They had they built some SN95 FR500 cars with double wishbone front and, and the, you know, the five liter uh, FR500 motor. And what I found is like at the other end of the, the uh, road Atlanta, the second right-hand turn, I got the, every time I get the one spot in, in the turn in the back where it started to get loose. And the same thing happened going under the bridge. Just before I had a little squiggle in there. So by the time you hit the bridge, you're flying. I get this at the same spot every single time. So I went back and we plotted the geometry and uh, what I found is that as the car got to a certain degree of roll, and don't ask me because this is a long time ago, when it got to a certain degree of roll, both rear wheels, okay, both rear wheels steered in the wrong direction, which is why the car got loose. <clears throat> if I'm gonna make a right hand turn, you get to a certain point of roll, and both rear wheels steer left, which makes it loose. That's why and we've got two fixes for that in our in our you know our, our phase one kit. Uh, that has the, the forward torque brace and the aluminum diff bushings. We also have a rear steer kit, which takes not all of it, but uh, a lot of that rear steer out of the car. When we do the full geometry change, then we take all the rear steer out. That's so, the so, but you know, I, I don't like rear steer. I mean, I, I felt what rear steer does and I don't like it. That's why I fixed it. But uh, no, I, I just stick with, to me, uh, my opinion, the back just needs to go straight and the front needs to steer. Back pushes, front steers. Okay, here's our next question. Christopher has a question regarding brake pads. Um, how that works, I, he thought that the idea of bedding is to have uh, pad material on your brake rotors. How does how does this pre-bedding work? What? Okay, uh, pad material on your brake rotors. <coughs> I don't know if you, the, the rotors are shiny. Uh, they're really shiny. If you get if you get uh, material buildup on the rotors, they chatter. Uh, it's it's not so much the the. I mean, what you're doing when you bed pads, you're evacuating all the volatiles that from the compounds that when they compound all the volatiles that are trapped in the brake pads, and you got to get them up to operating temperature so those volatiles evaporate out. That's why I say when you're bedding a brake pad, it gets to a certain point. Uh, and it smells, you smell the pads, the pedals hard as a rock and doesn't stop. Uh, that means you pretty much got all the volatiles out and it goes. Uh, I, 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 know, you know, I don't know about putting material on the rotor. What you do though, if you got new rotors, you've got to season them uh, almost, almost like it's a bedding a brake pad, but not, it doesn't take as long. You've got to sort of, if it's a brand new rotor, uh, you have to sort of introduce the brake pad to the rotor. You don't want to go out and just bam, hit the brakes and kill the road. goes, ah, scare the daylights out of it. So you need to just, you know, do some uh, braking, low, uh, medium braking, just keep braking, braking and braking. And, you know, it, it doesn't take long before you get, you know, get the rotors kind of used to the brake pads and get up to temperature. Uh, so, you know, I don't, I, I don't know about the, the compound. 
I don't want compound on my I want compound on the pads, not on the rotor. And do you do you uh, can you season and break in the brake pads at what together, or is yeah. it best to do it separately? Yeah, no, you just just have to. Well, the, if you're if you're bedding pads, you can do them both at the same time. You just have to start slowly, and just keep working up because the whole idea is to work up to operating temperature, at uh, at, at like a kind of like kind of like a, a stair step up. Like I say, you never never want to go out with brand new brand new rotors, brand new brake pads, and just stab the brakes. Uh, they what happens is they get wow, they get all excited and they kind of like they poop themselves. And what happens is the brake pads wear out really fast. Um, let's see, here's one from another one from Herstifer. Let me read his. Oh, I just lost it. Okay, one moment. We'll go to Wendy since I can't find her servers. Uh, Wendy, uh, there we go. Got some questions about an independent rear car, not a Mustang. It's major competitor. Will Kenny talk to me about it? Uh, yeah, I'll do what I can. Uh, you know, Wendy, remember we talked about high temperature uh, radio caps. Uh, I use them on, on the older cars. But for like the 197s, you get the silly screw on cap that's supposed to be 16 pounds. It never is. I found the solution for you. Uh, one of our suppliers will build a, uh, the, the, uh, a reservoir tank for the radiator with a screw on cap. Uh, so, you, we, so we can put like a 23 pound uh, radiator cap uh, on, on your car. But you just have to get the, the tank that's got the right neck on it. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I know. I'll do the best I can talking to you about the, you know, the IRS. Just schedule, schedule, you know, one of the 15 minute things. Okay, we have a, a, by the way, guess who is in the house? Who is in the house? Camposano. Jim. Ah, man. I haven't seen you for so long. I, <clears throat> Jim Camposano, and we, that's, we go way, way back. We met him, this is like in the mid 90s. Uh, he was the editor of Muscle Mustang Magazine. That's when they're still up in North Jersey. And uh, uh, we did kind of a, a, a joint event because they're all drag racers. And uh, we did kind of an event, and he came to the event, and I, I taught him uh, truck driving. And uh, he thought it was such a valuable experience that he kept sending editors to me to be, be trained. I talked, talked, we talked to Evan the other week, and he was you know, one, of, one of the, the guys from Muscle Mustangs. But Jim's a really cool guy, and he actually, I remember this specifically, he did his first solo at a driving event at Watkins Glen. So how cool is that? So, Jim, I'm really glad to see you. And, Jim, uh, I just haven't gotten around to calling you, but we want you on the show. So how many other people would like to hear from Jim Camposano? He, you're pretty well known in the industry, Jim. Okay, let's see. Here's yeah, for better and for worse. <laughs> Okay, Sal has a question. When the brake rotors cool down, does the brake paint go back to the uh, cold color, or does it stay at the maximum heat color it's, from the last one? You know, it stays at maximum heat, which is which is why you know, why you know, people say they use a, like a come and use an infrared on the, on the rotors. That's that's no good. I mean, that's only telling you what the rotor temperature is right now. What you want to know is what <clears throat> what is the maximum temperature under hard braking, you know, going into a corner. Uh, if you think, if you've seen like the, like Daytona or Le Mans or some of those at night, uh, the rotors you know glow red. They get that hot going into a corner. You want, so you want to know what the maximum temperature is, so that you can, you can get your your uh, uh, brake pads uh, correctly. The other cool thing is if you know you're at one level of driving and it comes up to let's say this the second color and you get better, then it'll change. So it, it'll, it'll, you know, it, it doesn't go back to red. It stays the color of maximum temperature. And as you go faster and faster, it'll keep changing. So you can keep track of what, how your progress is on braking. Okay. And here's a, just an interesting little question. And this, I want to make a comment. This is from Facebook user. So if you see your name under as Facebook user, when we're pulling up these questions, that means you have not given uh, authorization for your name to show. We're streaming through something called StreamYard. And it asks you at the very top of the comments if you authorize to use your name on the Facebook. So if you'd like to see your name, you need to authorize it. Oh, well, this is a good question from Facebook user. 
Uh, <laughs> he said, I love pads that are progressive, not ones which grab hard all at once. Uh, that's, that's another thing about you know, choosing your right brake pad. Uh, the brake pads, there's two things on, on how brake pads work is, is the initial bite and the modulation uh, and release, I guess three things. Uh, and <clears throat> like it, a really a race pad, a hardcore race pad is going to have a in, tremendous initial bite. Why? Because you know, racing, you're looking every tenth of a second you get, you hit the brakes, you want boom, you want the car to stop now. Uh, in, in track driving, it's, it's not that important. In fact, I, I teach people not to do super threshold braking. That means coming up in the very last second, standing on the brakes. Uh, because first of all, it's not a race. Uh, you know, Roger Penske isn't scouting in, in the tower. Uh, and you're going to wear your brake pads out. Uh, we had one customer up at uh, Audubon that we built, built up his, his boss Mustang for him. And uh, he, let, he always let his mechanic drive. And, you know, he went through a set of brake pads in a day. Well, why? Because the guy went up to the corner and just nailed the brakes, you know. And on a race car, you get one race out of a set of pads. So what, what I do, not only is it progressive, uh, pads that are progressive, but also how you use them. You know, we've, uh, we talk about more of this in the academy, too, is I, I have a specific way of using the brakes that, it slows me down to what I need to get around the corner, uh, and my brake pads and rotors last, you know, you know, quite a while. But I mean, I'm still really, really quick on track. So, yeah, progressive is good because it doesn't surprise you. Also, if you have too hard of a compound, one that grabs really, really quickly. Here's another thing I forgot to tell you: if you've got a really, really aggressive compound with street tires, not going to work. Uh, the tires also play the type of tires you have also play into. Uh, what brake pads you get because you don't want super aggressive pads for street tires because they'll grab the tires and just stop in a flat spot. Them. Sticky tires, grabby brakes. Okay, here's Christopher's question. He said, uh, regarding end links, my dealer, when installed my front bar, said that I should run it full soft as my end links don't look strong enough to support it on stiff. On stiff. Is that true? Uh, I say no. No? Uh, if he's if he's running the uh, stock end links, I mean, you know, Ford stuff is tough. You know, the trucks are tough, the cars are you know tough. That's that's how we beat Porsche in 1987 with the Saline Mustangs is because the Mustangs were tougher than nails, and we you know back back in the in the 70s and 80s endurance racing as you drive hard for the first two thirds and I really get to it for the last little bit of the race. And the only way we could beat Porsche is we just ran the absolute daylights out of those cars. We ran it absolutely as hard as they would go from green flag to checker flag, which meant that the, you know, the, those cars had to themselves run as hard as we did. And, you know, we won, we snagged all four championships away from Porsche. Okay. Um, we have another question here uh, from Facebook user. I think you can figure out who this one is. How did Scott do when he drove, drove it? Remember? Thanks for the adder to the number 44 car history. Who do you think that is? Gee. Yeah. Uh, listen, S Scott Pruitt is an amazing driver. Anything he drives, he's good at. My first experience with Scott Pruitt was 1987. Uh, most sport, that's up in Canada, 24-hour race, in the dark, in the light rain. He had commitments. He was driving, I think, with Steve. And he had other driving commitments for Trans Am that Saturday. He flew in. He got there you know, late at night. Uh, he, you know, he jumped into a car he's never been in before on, you know, a, a track that he wasn't that familiar with in the dark. And within, I'm going to say, four or five laps, and then his times were right there. Um, just absolutely impressed the hell out of me. I mean, the guy can drive. Uh, no matter what he puts his, he puts his butt into, He's going to drive it well. He's going to be quick. He's just like, like I say, I mean, how many times has he won Daytona? And hi to my family at home. <laughs> hey, here's another good question. Uh, I'm currently using an x pipe with Flowmaster dumps, and it's not very tidy. Do you have a favorite side exhaust kit for all-out racing? Uh, yeah, we actually, why don't you call and talk to me about that? Because typically we build our own. Uh, there is one company that has, I, I like their side exhaust because it's flat. 
It's not a big tube, but it comes out and it's flat. Uh, it, and it looks pretty cool. A lot of NASCAR type guys use it. Uh, yeah, give me a call and I'll try to remember who has that. But that, that's that's to be the only set. We, we typically build our own side exhaust. But that would be the one that I, I'd suggest at least for you know the exit because it's you know about that long and it's flat, which means you know it doesn't scrape on anything. Okay, and we're getting into summertime, and we lots of people have things going on on Saturday. So these are for the people that are rewatching or finding it for the first time. The show you can always find all the episodes, all forty nine episodes. We have the forty nine. Yes, yes, forty nine episodes on uh, the Kenny Brown Performance TV YouTube channel, and we also are going to be playing it again on the both Facebook page. Our, Speed Therapy Society Facebook group and the Kenny Brown Performance Facebook group uh, later in the week. So you'll be able to view it then. Yeah, just, I mean, yeah, because, you know, weather's getting nice. At least here, the sun's shining. Uh, it was like 60 degrees yesterday, 50-something today. I mean, in spring, young men's thoughts turns to fancies of racetracks. <laughs> That's good. Okay, here is another one. Well, anyway, what I'm saying okay, is... Sure. You know, you don't have to be here Saturday morning. Go play the racetrack and then watch it in the rerun. Yeah, we get a, a ton of after viewers. So, um, and if you want to ask, you can't make it and you need to have, want Kenny to answer a question, just uh, throw it on Kenny Brown Performance or on Speed Therapy Society. And yeah, you know, yeah, that's that's where all the questions I answered today came through the Speed Therapy Society mm -hmm. Facebook group mm -hmm. or the Kenny Brown Performance Facebook group. Yeah, we got group. a few from that this week. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, and yeah, throw them in there. I, that's I mean, that, that's why I'm here. I'm I'm here to you know help you learn. So Kobe Ward has a question. Will spirited street mountain road driving need a higher temp brake pad than the typical street pay, pad? Uh, I'm gonna say probably yes, but not too aggressive uh, because you're not really standing on the brakes, but you're doing like high speed. You know, some something like that. You know, our, our level one, the up to 800 degrees. Uh, might be just a ticket. Uh, yeah, you can call, you can call me on that. Uh, and if you're really really fast, then the next one you could do too. But that's not really a street pad. So yeah, you want you want probably a, a better brake pad, but you don't want something too aggressive because two things will happen. If you go too high on temperature and you're running at a low temperature, a they squeak, b they make dust. Okay, let's see. Let's um, let's see, Kenny, this is from uh, Clifford, and that's me, Facebook user. Kenny, your Scott story made me smile. In the dark and the rain, no experience in the car, scary, impressive. Yeah, he was. I mean, the, the other, the other uh, going back to, the, you know, the, the endurance racing that we did, uh, SECA Pro Endurance Racing, is uh, the other driver that really impressed me was Pete Halsman. And uh, every, every couple of years I see him at the, the uh, vintage races here in Indy, but the thing about him is that he was so deliberate. I mean, he's just a really easygoing guy. Uh, you know, he'd get into the car and it's like no panic. You know, he just, you know, put his gloves on, make sure they're tight and adjust himself. And, and come on, come on, what are you doing? And, uh, but as soon as, uh, as soon as he left the pits, I mean, he was a demon on track. So it was kind of, kind of really, really cool to watch. Okay. And I think uh, this is last call for questions. So this is your last call to throw in a question. Can you want you to tell them a little bit about the the transform your driving experience that's coming up? <laughs> no, sis. You've done this how many times? Yeah, I know. I, I, got, I got so many notes laying around this morning. We do we went through a lot. We went through a lot. Today. I know. Okay. What we're going to learn is uh, in transforming driving experience, you're going to learn the first five critical steps to transforming. You're going to learn my five secrets to building great cars that give you a great driving experience because a great driving experience comes from a great car. Imagine that. And then we'll talk about, uh, you know, setting up cars, uh, a little bit of dialing in the cars for performance and some driving techniques. Uh, it's just a little bit of everything. It's, it's kind of like a, a smattering of what we go into in super depth in the academy. Like we spent a whole week on just shocks, talking about shock absorbers. Uh, two weeks on aerodynamics, two weeks on uh, suspension geometry. Oh, suspension geometry. Every every in, uh, session that we do, 
Uh, there is the the uh, PowerPoint is in the resource section for for you know to go back and reference, except the geometry. We talk about it, but because I share so many of my secrets, it's there's nothing in print. You just have to go by what I say. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. The, uh, this you're talking about Speed Therapy Academy, Academy. now, yeah, and that Academy. that actually has its own website with uh, its own portal, so you can capture everything. Yeah, it's, it's got its own watch. portal. Okay, so um, also with the uh, driving, I don't see many more questions coming, and I just want to mention one more thing about the Transform Your Driving Experience Workshop. We are, I guess, you are giving away, not me, giving away. A free or scholarship to the Speed Therapy yeah. Academy. That well, that's, is a huge oh, I'm deal. I'm surprised. That's, that's <laughs> news to me. <laughs> that is a huge deal. So make sure you show up for the first one. Register now. The the link is in the comments. Register now, and we'll see you at the first Speed Therapy Academy or no Transforming Driving Experience, Experience Workshop, March 30th. Yes, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Mm -hmm. But you need to be register. There. Yeah, you need to register. So. And be a Speed Therapy Society Facebook group member. Yeah, you have to register through. You have to be in the society because the society is like this is this is a group of really like-minded people that you know I try to you know do as much as I can for. Okay, that is it. We wrapped up. Well, there we go. Uh, now here's uh, here's here's something that what I usually do is I turn down the bottom of the page and I go. Next week, what we're going to talk about and other our X's. So we don't know yet. That's why you need to tell me what you want me to talk about. We haven't decided what we're going to talk about yet, so send in some, tell me what you want to talk about and we will. Uh, or I'll just make something up. So listen, I'm glad you could join us this morning. I hope you learned something. Uh, certainly share it with, with your friends. You know, don't forget the th thumbs up thing and and you know the buttons I always talk about. So listen, we'll have a, a good weekend. If it's it's nice here, I hope it's nice where you are. Have a good weekend, a good week, and we will see you either next Saturday morning or in one of the replays one of the evenings. So goodbye. <laughs>